Go grab one of the mic and put it in the hands. Or I could move my laptop. How far can I walk? I can go to here. And how far over here can I go? Like there? Okay. I'll try to stand in one place because I know it's really annoying to try to follow me back and forth. Um, all right, well, my name is Joe Grand. Um, some of you guys might know me as Kingpin. Um, I, uh, let's see, I guess I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown right now of wh why I'm doing this talk. Um, I, I grew up in the hacker community. I've always been a hacker. Uh, and I've always been a hardware guy, an electrical engineer. Um, I was part of the loft back in the early 90s, the hacker kind of think tank um, in, in Boston and uh, ended up getting sucked into this TV world and uh, just sort of never planned it, but um, ended up being a TV host of, of a, a TV show called Prototype This that was on Discovery Channel, and I'll give you a bunch of details of the show. But um, basically, I, I learned a lot during that time about how to um, try to convey boring technical stuff in a fun way that people can understand. So we, we thought it would be sort of fun to, to you know, give this talk and just share some of my experiences with the TV show. Um, and maybe you guys can kind of get some ideas about um, little things you can do you know, in, in, your, in your report writing, in your video making, whatever it is, to kind of share the technical knowledge that you need to in a way that's kind of fun and won't turn people off. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I usually give technical talks. So this is, this is one I put together just for this, just for this conference. So I think it's going to be sort of fun. Um, this, is, this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but this is what I think the security industry looked like 15, 20 years ago. And I, I have industry in quotes, but um, you know, it's a bunch of guys hanging out doing stuff. And uh, here's, the, uh, here's the security industry today. So you still have like all the hackers and, and the, the guys doing stuff, and then you have the, the guys in suits, which they're also doing stuff. Um, you have some cool hackers, the media is involved, you know, the, the internet has just totally changed the entire landscape of security. So now it's not just a bunch of guys, you know, that are, that are hackers that are doing stuff in, in their clubhouses or in their bedrooms, but it's guys that now, you know, there's executives, there's PR behind it, there's, there's companies obviously, you know, running exhibits and uh, marketing and sales. It's a real industry now. Notice the quote, the, the quotes are gone from here, right? So. The security industry is a real industry, and you guys know that, and I know that. So it's sort of, you know, you have this diverse collection of people now. It's not just technical people talking to technical people, or it's not just guys in suits talking to guys in suits, except I, I see a few of you guys that are in suits that I know are technical. So um, I, you get the point, though. Um, a lot of different varying levels of technical co competency. Um, you know, some people in the industry aren't technically competent, and they don't want to be. That's not their job, um, but they still need to learn information and you know, learn about the research that you're doing um, uh, in, in order to do their job. So you know, we need to just figure out how we can share information the right way. Everybody has different agendas because you know, the president of a company isn't going to be looking necessarily at bits and bytes uh, you know, of some latest exploit, but they might need to know how to go give a talk on it at a high level to, to, to get clients. Um, you know, it, it varies for everybody. Um, so you know, what's the problem? The problem is how to creatively um, share information with people. So, I, you know, I mentioned advisories, but you have demonstrations, product demonstrations. If you're doing videos, um, I've seen a lot of really, really bad videos. You know, and it's just a guy like, here's our software version 2.0, and when you click on the button, it does this. And, you know, that, that lasts about 30 seconds until you turn off the video. So, um, you know, if you're doing videos, you don't need, like, crazy video skills um, to, to do some fun stuff. Maybe talk about software functionality, if you have to explain bug fixes to people, who knows, whatever it is. Uh, you just need to tell a compelling story. So um, this is sort of my, my example and what I learned about how to tell a compelling story through Prototype This. And um, this was something that, so I mentioned um, it aired in October 2008 in the United States. Um, it's basically four guys building prototypes of, of crazy things, and I'll run through all of that. Um, but uh, let's see. In February 2009, it just started airing all over the world. And um, it was made by the same production company that made Mythbusters. And they sort of had this idea of like, oh, okay, we'll just throw some guys in a room and start filming them, and we're gonna have a hit show like Mythbusters. Um, and, and obviously that didn't work. Um, we were very well received. We had about a million viewers per episode, which I think is a lot. Um, but uh, you know, we weren't this instant hit because the, you know, we weren't 
we weren't marketed properly, first of all, but, but second of all, it just cost too much money and it took too much time to make each episode. So there was already this misconception right when the show started about how, how easy engineering was or how complicated engineering was. And, and I'll get into that. And that's why there was this, this battle between engineering and production, um, which is what forced us to kind of come up with these creative things. And you'll see there's all sorts of similarities to, to what I was fighting in this and what you guys probably have to deal with um, you know, in, in a corporation. Um, but the, the, uh, the show's still up, the website's still up, it was a great experience. Um, and here's basically, there's four of us. So um, I was the uh, electrical engineer um, and the hardware hacker guy. So I did a lot of the low level interfacing, um, the design, the controls of all these various things. Um, my son, who's five months old, uh, just a few days ago, happened to make a cameo appearance on the last episode, which is airing later this month. Um, we have Zaz Brooks, who is a robotics guy, um, software programmer, just insane software hacker from MIT. Then we had Mike North, who was a material scientist, uh, mechanical engineer, um, who came from UC Santa Barbara. And then Terry Sandin, who was our machinist and special effects guy, and, and um, I guess, uh, um, what Adam look alike from Mythbusters is what they say. Um, but you know, the four of us each had unique skills, so we, you know, we came together to build stuff, and it was great because there wasn't this overlap. There wasn't a lot of um, you know, kind of battles between us as far as like what design was better, because no one was going to tell me what electrical design was better, because I just do what I needed to do to get it working, and I wasn't going to go tell Terry how to machine something. So it worked out well. Um, we built a lot of crazy stuff, so here's, I'll run through a few examples. Um, this thing was 10-foot giant boxing robots that would uh, move based on the movements of the fighters outside of the ring. So we had um, those boxing gloves had accelerometers in them, and uh, basically when you moved, when you threw different punches, the robots would do the same thing, and we had um, uh, glyphs on our back, so when you moved back and forth, we had a camera detect that and calculate the, the left and right and forward and backwards movement and move the robots. So that was sort of fun. Oh, I should mention that we did, um, we did most of these projects in about two weeks uh, and with not a lot of money, and I'll, I'll get into that. Uh, let's see, some other stuff. Let's see, I wonder if I can adjust. It's a little hard to see. The contrast is weird, but um, we did uh, this six-legged all-terrain vehicle that uh, w was basically a scaled-up version of... Um, some sort of insect, I can't remember exactly what kind, but it had this unique tripod gate. So once it was up and statically stable, it would always be statically stable. So we were trying to get these, you know, basically you have three legs down at all times and you're kind of walking along. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, I had to do a bunch of custom, custom electronics design. We did one, one build, which uh, is that center slide that says, oh my God, that's so weird. Is this uh, something we called the virtual Let's see. Well, we called it the Sea Cave, but the episode was called Virtual Sea Adventure, and it was basically this virtual underwater um, environment where you're scuba diving, so I'm completely immersed in water, and there's a projector around you, a dome um, projection screen, and then you're basically controlling a remotely operated sub in a shark tank somewhere else. Um, and the theory was you could put it in a reef, you know, in the Bahamas, and you'd be in your swimming pool controlling this ROV underwater. Um, so that was totally crazy. Some firefighter um, projects we did, 30-foot giant water slide simulator that was totally computer controlled and uh, you'd sit in this thing and, and it would basically project an image on the screen inside of, the, uh, inside of this big moving donut that would spin, speed up, slow down, tilt left and right, there was water in it and you'd feel like you're actually riding. So the stuff was like pretty technically complicated and to be able to explain that to an audience is very hard, especially an audience of millions. When most people just want to see the final product, they don't really care how it works. And the goal of the show was to follow the engineering process. So, you know, we had to explain stuff that, that was, you know, boring to probably everyone outside of us. Um, and I think we did a pretty good job at it. Uh, what else? We had an autonomous pizza delivery vehicle that would just drive down the street and deliver your pizza. Um, a cannon, this lower, this thing on the lower uh, bottom of the screen is a cannon that would shoot a life jacket out to somebody in distress out in the water. Um, so you had a, a, a wristband transmitter that you'd wear in the water and you'd hit a button and it would transmit your GPS coordinates. So there's all sorts of stuff. Oh yeah, and then this thing here, Zaz was in there. This is the get up and go. It's like this sleeping pod that would rise up. Well first, well you'd sleep in it and then it would shake you to wake you up. It would rise up, um, rip your clothes off, shower, shower you, um, uh, give you all like your hygiene stuff, toothbrush and everything, um, and then give you new clothes, will dry you, and then give you new clothes, and then it would open the door and, and you step out. So, kind of like Jetsons. Um, so, 
<laughs> so all of this stuff we did uh, was not a lot of money. We had about um, $13,000 build budget per episode, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not when you have to buy all of the steel and all of the equipment and all of the you know one piece, um, just crazy electronic pieces, um, and not a lot of time. So they wanted us to do it in two weeks per episode. And actually, when we started, they were like, well, you know, one, watching one, episode, one, one build is sort of boring. Let's, watch, let's show everybody two builds in one episode. And the episode's an hour long, so it'd be half an hour per build. So they wanted two builds in two weeks, which is just ridiculous. Nobody builds stuff in a few days. And then you have to be filmed, which is also a totally different thing. So you walk in the door three times so they can get different angles and everything. So you know, filming a scene ends up taking all day when you should be working on the actual project. Um, so, so that was a challenge. Um, we did end up getting a lot of companies that would actually give us equipment and we'd just say, hi, we're on TV, can we use your you know, $50,000 worth of steel? And they'll say yes, but there's a lot of times we still have to buy stuff. Um, so here's where, where we started to see some similarities. Um, so TV production and editors and executives, and I'll probably get sued for this at some point, um, but I figure the truth has to come out. Um, it, most uh, of the people in the television industry aren't technical. They don't care to be, they don't want to be. They just want to see this final product. They want to see like, you know, the finale, the, the build at the end. Um, basically, you know, we were filming the show for 18 months. And at the end of 18 months, we still had executives in the production company say, can't we make it cheaper? Can't you do it faster? I don't understand what's so hard. And it's like, oh man, you know, it's re just really difficult. So they were the people that we were trying to convince and we were trying to show through, the, through these crazy videos that I'm going to show you. Um, that the stuff is hard, and it's hard to convey the difficulty of things a lot of times. So you could be working on a project, you know, in the lab, and you're like, oh my god, I just spent three weeks, I found this crazy buffer overflow, and you know, I, I, I flipped this one bit, it's so cool, and like you tell all your friends, and they think it's awesome, and then you go and like, you know, tell the CTO or whatever, he's like, I'll get it. Or you tell the CEO, and they're like, oh, that sounds easy, you know, it's one bit, of course, you know, so it, it, how do you convey that stuff? Um, and they didn't understand the complexity of the tasks, and that just killed me, because I, I, I run my own business outside of the show. I do product development and licensing, and I break products sometimes, and you know, I basically do my own thing when I want to, the way I want to. So to be able to now be face-to-face -face with people who, who are trying to make a TV show based around our work but not understand it was hard. Um, and they just assumed everything was easy. So there was also no planning, no pre-production. Um, for the first six episodes, they just threw us in a room, and, and the four of us tried to figure out what we had to do. Um, and of course, they're like, hurry up and start building so we don't waste our cameraman's time. So very, very challenging. Um, over time, they learned a little bit and we got to actually like, produce some stuff in advance so we, so we could actually film interesting things. Um, and they also wanted stuff like this, x-ray glasses. They're like, can you do the personal force field um, in two weeks? And we're like, um, no, <laughs> but we can build you a water slide. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, that was one of the things, it, it, you know, we needed to come up with stuff that had never been done before, that looks cool on TV, and that we could do in two weeks. And if you go to YouTube, pretty much everything's been done to some extent. And, you know, you, you can, you find somebody that's, that's uh, you know, built a water slide simulator in their backyard, or, or tried to build a truck that can drive over traffic, or, you know, anything. Somebody's done it. So we had to come up with these projects. It was just really hard. So, yeah, the x-ray glasses came up, I don't know how many times. Um, in, in, the, uh, in our design process. But the similarities are striking. So I talk a lot about TV production because I just came out of the TV world and being an engineer in that world is just not good. Um, so I'm a little bit jaded from that, but it was a great experience and now I get to you know, kind of educate everyone else about it. But it's the same thing if you look at you know, whether you're in security and you're trying to explain something to the media or you're a technical person and you have to explain something to management. Um, you know, they, they uh, their mindset is probably very similar a lot of times to this. And it's really frustrating. And actually, I had to deal with that when I was in the security industry as well. And, and I, you know, I still do, because I still deal with media a lot and still write advisories and, and give talks on security. And you want to make sure that you can actually convey the right information. Um, so here, you know, th this might not be exactly true, but this is what I think kind of us versus them. And you know, a lot of people say, oh, you're not supposed to, you know, it's not supposed to be a head-to-head -head battle or whatever. But you know, I think it is. Um, so in, in television, what we wanted to do is kind of show off the smart engineering stuff that we could do, um, you know, do all these clever designs so our peers who watch the show would be like, oh, those guys are smart. You know, they're not just talking heads that are, that are reading off a cue card. Um, and we want to show off our skills because that's sort of why we want to be on TV. Um, but the TV people, they wanted something to look cool on TV. They wanted something that they could sell advertising space and appeal to a wide audience. You know, they didn't care about showing off our skills necessarily. 
unless it would just kind of strengthen the show. Um, but then if you look in the security space, it's the same sort of thing. Technical people, a lot of times, I could be wrong, but um, I think in general this is true. People want to show smart engineering. They want to show off their skills. They want to be able to do cool things um, and impress their peers and kind of help the business. And then the business side wants to educate their customers, their end users, um, enhance their products, get media coverage, maybe not showing off the skills of particular people. So I, I think there's similarity there. So this is kind of, if you take nothing else out of this other than, the, other than, other than this slide. Um, it, you know, you've heard the, the whole thing, can't see the forest for the trees. Um, and I, I think this is, this is true, and I struggle with this every day, is being a technical person, I want to you know, share every single detail with everybody. Um, but that doesn't necessarily help you, and sometimes it hurts you when you're trying to actually you know, convey things to people that don't care about the technical information. Um, so, Sometimes we need to if we're sharing information within a group or you know, within the specific security space that we're not dealing with non-technical people. But in general, I think we, we, uh, we kind of feel like we need to share more information than is actually necessary. And I'll get to videos, I promise. I figured I'd go through all the words first. Um, so the thought process that we went through. So when we started filming the show, uh, you know, they threw us in the room. And let's see, the first, the first build we did that will probably never see the light of day was this unstealable bicycle. And it was uh, this bike that basically had all these different sensors and alarm systems, and you'd lock it up. And uh, if a thief stole it, um, it would, uh, you know, they're riding away, it would lock the steering, lock the brakes, they lock their feet in the pedals, the guy would fall over. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was actually a lot of fun to test. And, um, and then once they're on the ground, they're locked up, they're wriggling around, they can't get out of the bike. Um, the, uh, there's a GPS and a cell phone module that would call the police and send a text message to the owner and uh, with the GPS coordinates and then also use speech synthesis to tell the police, you know, my, the bike is stolen and it's at these coordinates. Um, but that was something that, you know, we had a lot of crazy stuff in there, cell phone module. We had a, a force sensor for the, for the seat of the bike seat so we'd be able to know if the thief was sitting on the bike before we locked the, uh, the pedals. So all these different sensors and um, we thought that was really interesting to share but we had no process to do it. And we filmed some stuff, and we're like, here's an accelerometer. You know, this detects if the bike's moving. Um, and, and for the final cut of that, they didn't use any of it because they thought it was so boring. And actually, what was really funny is we, our first camera guy, I guess, had filmed a bunch of stuff for like National Geographic and, you know, really beautiful scenery and shots and stuff. And he's sitting in, in our workshop filming, filming me soldering. Um, and he's like, this is boring. I can't do this. And he walked out and like went to the machine shop because it's cooler there and there's you know sparks and stuff. So um, <laughs> that, that was pretty rough. Not, it's not like I haven't heard that soldering is boring, um, but that was a little bit of a shock. And I mean, you know, you can apply that however you want. You know, if somebody sees you coding and they're like, that's boring, I'm gonna go, you know, play video games instead or whatever it is. Um, just, I don't know, it, it, was, a, it was an ego, an ego downer, I guess. Um, but so really the, the thought process here you need to understand your target. So put yourself in the mind of the audience, just like you know what I say a lot of times if you're analyzing um, security products or if you're designing security products, you need to put yourself in the mind of an attacker and say, okay, how are these guys going to attack the product? Or what, you know, what ports do I need to protect if someone is going to start you know, trying to own our network? Um, same thing with conveying information is um, understanding your target. Who, who is your actual audience? What do they need to get out of it? Um, what do they actually want to see and what do they actually want to read if you're writing something? So we thought about that, and we're like, okay, you know, there's all these different people. We can't control who's going to watch the show, um, and we want to convey technical information because we know a lot of technical people are going to watch the show, but there's also going to be, you know, that's going to be like point, I think Discovery said like the technical audience was 0.1% or something. You know, there's, there's many more non-technical people than there are technical people. So we wanted to share the technical stuff, but still make it so, you know, my grandma can watch the show and, and get it. Um, so that was, our, that was our audience. We knew our, our main audience was non-technical people, but we had to still make it fun. And then understanding the motivation of what are you trying to get out of your research um, or what you're trying to share. So these two are, are sort of related. Um, what information do you actually need to present? So if I'm you know, talking about accelerometers, I might not need to get into the detail of exactly what an accelerometer is. If I can just say at a high level to the people that don't know, you know an accelerometer is going to uh, um, give you a representation of acceleration or whatever. Um, and you can visually show it. And I'll show you examples of that. 
And then what does your audience need to take from it? Um, so really, I don't know, this is my attempt. Obviously, I can't tell you guys how to write better or edit video better, but it's just sort of, you know, maybe this stuff will help you a little bit in just giving you ideas about how to creatively do stuff. Um, so breaking down the information in the segments and the key points, and you'll see this when I, when I show some videos um, of what we tried to do here. So we had the overview of like, what's the goal? In our case, it's showing off the electronics um, for the TV show, but maybe it's, you know, what's the goal of the research? What's the goal of, of, of your bug fix or whatever? Um, what are the different pieces involved? Just describing those. Um, and then the demonstration, I think is the most important. It's kind of showing your results. Um, and one, one thing I, I actually was taking a memoirs writing course, and I'm not a very good um, non-technical writer. And uh, it was really interesting because it's sort of like writing a memoir is kind of this creative fiction, where, or creative nonfiction, where you're, you, know, you need to really describe the scenes and everything. Um, and they say a lot, show, don't tell. So a lot of advisories that you see in a lot of technical work is just telling, right? It's somebody saying, um, if you do X and do Y, Z is going to happen, and that's bad, and you need to fix your product. But if you can show, and you're explaining, say, to the media, and you, know, you, you might say that, and they're like, great. But if you're like, yeah, OK, well, imagine this guy he's sitting at his computer, and you know, he sends an email to your mom. And your mom says, oh, that's a great email, and clicks on it. And then you know, this window pops up, and she does this. And kind of you know, paint them a story about what the research is good for, and what it can do, and how it can own your machine, or you know, just something to make it a little more visual and exciting, then I think they'll get it more. And they'll be able to share that with people. Because if you go to your mom and say, yeah, you know, I found this awesome bug. If you, if you, um, you know, click, click on this awesome dancing baby, or whatever, you can see how how kind of not up to, the, up to date I am with security stuff. Click on the dancing baby. You know, that's not as exciting as you know, telling her a story and, and explaining how it's actually going to bone her. So um, I don't know. You know show, show, don't tell, um, I think applies to, uh, to this stuff, not only like creative nonfiction. Um, any additional details? If you do need to give details, that's fine. And then a conclusion, explain what you've just achieved. You know, it's just like in, if you're writing and tell them what, you tell them what you're going to tell them, you know, tell them and then tell them what you told them. Um, but I don't know. This is, this is sort of what I follow. Um, so we thought about that when it was time to tell our TV story you know, and, and, and convey this information that it took a long time to come up with a way that we could actually show the stuff and then have Discovery go, oh yeah, that actually works. Because even when we sent them these segments, and I'll show you a few of them, um, we had guys over there go, oh, I just don't get it. It's too goofy. It's too, it's too funny. And then you know, we'd send them a straight one, and they're like, ah, oh, it's too boring. Yeah, we don't like it. So you know, even, even after we did it, and they'd air it, and people would love it, and then the executives are like, ah, oh, I don't know. But then they ended up leaving them in, and, and they totally worked. So it's just a matter of kind of getting them to, to accept that. Because we were doing something that had never been done before on TV. You know, we weren't just grinding stuff and building motorcycles. We were building products and having to show the, uh, the complexity with that. So there's three different ways that we did this. One of them are podcasts, um, and I'll explain what all these are. Um, then we had demonstrations and tests, and then the payoff or the finale. Um, so the podcasts were something that basically um, was, was something that we came up with because you know, we had to explain the accelerometer. We had to explain these different position sensors we were using or the actuators or whatever. Um, or coding. You know, how do you explain coding to somebody? You film a guy typing on a keyboard or you film a guy soldering. It's like you can only show so much of that. And what they ended up doing actually is time-lapsing a lot of my work. It's like Joe goes to work on building the circuit board. And he's done. And now we go to the shop. So, <laughs> so you know, at least they showed it. But um, so these were based on some podcasts that I did with uh, Bree Pettis, who used to work at Make Magazine. Um, and we call them the Awesome Electronics Workshop. And this was something that we did um, in between filming the pilot and the actual season of this TV show. So I was free for a while, and Bree came over. And we're like, let's do some cool videos and, and show off some neat technology. So we did one on like GPS, um, on speech synthesis, on... Uh, LCD, on RFID, and basically had to build little projects with it. Um, but we didn't want to just be this, you know, a bunch of squares and just saying, plug the LCD into the RFID module, into the microprocessor, and do this. Like, we wanted to have fun with it. So we came up with these, like, crazy, quirky, funny, jump cut sort of things where it was a lot of fun, and we got to be really goofy, but we still shared the information. Um, and most of the time, people liked them. I think we had a few hundred thousand hits. And once in a while, we'd get somebody who's just like, I just want to see the technical content. But everyone else is like, ah, oh, it's sort of fun. Um, so you can check those out on the website, but that's where it came from. So when we came back from our break and started filming the season, 
I showed these to the editors and to the producers. I'm like, you know, maybe we can use something like this in the show. And they're like, oh my God, that's awesome. You know, this has never been done on TV. We can, we can be funny and goofy and like try to show stuff off. And I'm like, yes, I can be myself. Um, and it was cool because I was, t I mean, I'm totally goofy. I mean, you can tell. So um, anyway, so the first one I'll show you is, uh, so I'm going to show you two different podcasts. And I have, I have a bunch of them and I'll show them to you forever if you want. But for now, I'm just going to show you two. Um, uh, so the one on the left, which I'll show you first, is from our Anger Management Demolition Derby um, build, which basically was um, remote control cars that are affected by, the performance is affected by your physiological state. So you're controlling the car with a PlayStation 2 driving controller far away from the car, um, and then you have this emotive headset, which is connected to your head that's measuring various brain wave activities um, that uh, is supposedly measuring your thoughts. So you have to think about, the initial thing was you think about moving forward and the car would move forward, you think about moving back, but we changed it to you think about starting the car and the car will start. Um, and then we had galvanic skin response, which is measuring the sort of moisture stress response of your fingers, um, and that would reduce the speed of the car. So if you're too stressed, you can't drive as fast. Um, so that was kind of fun. It was a little bit of a stretch as far as the usefulness of the project, um, but it was still fun. So we came up with this podcast to explain some of Zaza's code because we had all this different hardware connecting together, sending data over the network that would end up going to this one computer that would process everything and then send information out to the remote control cars. Um, so even more, more so than electronics, Zaz hardly got any love because he was doing software all the time and it's like, oh look, Zaz is at the computer again. Um, so th this, was a, this was a really good example, I think, of trying to explain like multi-threaded software. Um, so let me, let me see if I can actually do this. This will be there. Okay. Right now, Zaz is coding. It might look like he's just playing around on the keyboard. But he's actually writing specialized programs that are going to tie all of these different parts of the build together. It's pretty complicated stuff. So for a little better explanation, some more detail about how everything really works. I present to you the Code Master. There's a lot of custom code that has to be written to get this anger management system to work. That's why you see me typing all the time. Code is a written set of instructions that tells a computer what to do, and I'm the one that has to write it. My code is made up of threads. A thread is like a little program that runs inside a larger one. There can be a bunch of threads, like Joe here, Hi. but they all run independently to perform a specific task. In this system, each car is controlled by four threads. A game controller thread, which takes data from the steering wheel and pedals. A biopack thread, which reads the driver's heart rate and perspiration level to regulate the car's performance. An emotive or mind control thread, which controls the car's transmission. And a car controller thread. So let's say the driver puts the pedal to the metal. A signal gets sent to the game controller thread, telling it to hit the gas. At the same time, the biopack thread is also getting data from the driver's body measuring heart rate and perspiration or galvanic skin response. At the same time as this, the emotive thread processes events from the emotive system and decides whether or not the car should be put into forward gear. Finally, the car controller thread looks at everything the other threads have produced and decides what to do with the car. If the driver's brain waves are calm and focused and their heart rate is good and their perspiration level shows they're cool and collected, the car controller thread puts the car in gear and hits the gas. But if the biopack and emotive threads show agitation, then the car controller thread will slow things down because the driver's getting too stressed. This is all just for one car. For four cars all working together, that's going to be a lot of threads. And if I can't get all those threads to work together, we're going to be dead in the water. So that was, uh, <laughs> that was one of them. But you could see there's all, you know, explaining threading to people is just crazy. So, that was, we tried to break it down a little bit and even starting off with like coding as a written set of instructions that do that. You know, it's like most people know that, but some people don't. So to, uh, you sort of just take things for granted sometimes when a lot of people don't actually get it. So that was sort of fun. We got a lot of email about that one and people are like, dude, I can't believe you explained multi-threaded software. We're like, yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, so the next one is and you can imagine doing that just straight, right? It's like the multi-threaded software, you have the GSR thread, and that communicates with this thread, and you know, no one's gonna watch it and no one's gonna care. 
Um, so the next one is from the Virtual Sea Adventure. Um, and basically for that one, we had, the under we had to be underwater. So we had this controller that was basically like a sea scooter, like an off-the-shelf sea scooter. And we modified that um, in a way that you could actually you know, control this ROV somewhere else. So this is a little segment on, um, on the magnetic sensor that was used. Uh, here it is. Oops. It would be nice if it opened in the same window. But it did not. Okay. Normally, control would come from a joystick, like you use in your basic video game. But most electromechanical devices don't do so well underwater. So I've come up with a solution using magnetic position sensors. So I got the magnet and I got the sensor. Pretty small, huh? Well, size isn't everything. It's how you use it. This nifty device can measure magnetic field and determine the position of the magnet in proximity to the sensor. As I move the magnet over the sensor, the output voltage of the sensor changes depending on the magnet's position. That voltage change is represented by the dot on the oscilloscope. See? It's moving. Cool. Simple translation? It's just like using a joystick where I can move up, down, left, and right, but it's completely contactless. And once I seal up the sensor, it'll work underwater. Now I have to figure out how to control physical objects with it. So Joe creates a playful test. Oh yeah. To show us how his controls work. I have the sensor connected to a microprocessor that controls two motors, the X and Y axes of the toy. So when I take my magnet and hold it over the sensor, I can draw pictures, just like I was using a joystick. Cool. But this is all just child's play. What I really have to do is take the sensor and the electronics and figure out an interface to control the ROV. Hmm. And while Joe pondered... Yeah, so that, that was that one. Um, you know, so it's sort of explaining, explaining stuff and, and a magnetic position sensor nobody really cares about, but I thought it was like super cool, um, basically because you can use it in, in all sorts of environments. Um, so, you know, it was like, but basically, instead of, you know, instead of using the joystick, which doesn't work underwater, you have this, and it works underwater. And, you know, that might be all that people take out of it, that you're using some sort of magnet to control something, but that's better than, than having them take nothing out of it. So I don't know. I thought those, those two were sort of fun. Uh, where's my mouse? Here it is. So the podcast, we tried to have um, at least, I think Discovery had actually mandated for a while that we have two podcasts per episode. And that was, he, that was like a huge win. It's like, oh my God, they want us to use two of these things. Um, so we tried to have two per episode, which is really cool. And basically all my work ended up being in podcasts, which was fine. Um, and there's all sorts of different ones. And sometimes the stuff didn't work, though. And actually, I'll show you. Um, I won't show you the podcasts that didn't work, but I'll show you some demonstrations that didn't. So demonstrations are another way that, that we can do things. And the podcasts were sort of these self-contained segments where you know, they'd show a lot of building, and then it would be like, let's go to the lair, which was our electronics lab, and see what you know, Joe's doing. Um, it was a little self-contained. But the demonstrations were things that we actually used as milestones along the way. Um, that might not be just related to electronics, they might not be just related to mechanical things, but it's like, okay, we're building um, a personal airbag system that will detect uh, if a person's falling from a height of 30 feet or more and deploy an airbag. Um, so one of the tests was, okay, let's, you know, we have the electronics done, let's test our free fall detection system and see how it works. So instead of just sitting in the lab and saying, okay, I'm gonna drop this box and see if like the light turns on or whatever, um, we actually came up with this system to um, fill, you know, use an airbag and our electronics with this big box filled with popcorn and just show what happens. Um, because we didn't, as engineers, we didn't need to do this, right? But to the audience to kind of share that, share something fun, we needed to do that. Um, and th this was sort of the heart of the show, is doing these demonstrations. Um, sometimes they didn't work because we'd try crazy things. Um, and I'll show, you, I'll show you a few of those that they didn't use on the show. Um, but sometimes they did. And, you know, just to make stuff fun. So, let's see, the first one I'm going to show you is the, uh, is for the wearable airbag episode. Um, actually, I'm going to show you two. Um, so, the first one is, so, of course, we had to do some research first. And, you know, most of the time, if you're researching, you're in your lab or you're at your desk doing research. Um, but we needed to show our research to explain why we're doing research um, and why we're doing the build. So, this first uh, video is some research on airbags. And we had to show why we couldn't just use a regular car airbag 
to deploy and to save you as you fell from 30 feet. Right? It's sort of like we knew that we couldn't use an airbag, but everybody, the viewers, are going to say, oh, well, these guys are building an airbag. Why don't they just use a car airbag? So we had to show why you can't. Um, so this might be, you know, you apply this to security, and it's like, um, you know, well, why can't you change the reset vector? I don't know. Um, well, let's see. Anyway, so we had to do our research, and here's what it looked like. Three, two, one. <laughs> oh. And then you go, oh, that's why we can't use airbags. So that makes a lot more sense than just telling somebody you can't use an airbag. <laughs> and that was filmed by, you see the camera crew down there, and my friend was up on the stairs who was just visiting us. And you can hear him, he goes, holy shit, like right in the background. <laughs> Because nobody knew what to expect from that. It was just totally violent. Poor little Timmy. <laughs> um, let's see. So that was actually used a little bit on the show. And then here's the, here's the demonstration of the free, fall, the free fall electronics with the box of popcorn. And this one we actually did in slow motion. Because I don't remember if the slow motion one made it. I don't even know if the, uh, yeah, I think the regular version made it into the show. But this one slow motion, I don't think this did. You can see it's dropping, and when it basically f detects free fall for a certain amount of time, it just pops, pops the, and we used a car airbag just to demonstrate the triggering circuitry, but blue popcorn everywhere, and the seagulls loved it, and it was really neat. Uh, and we got to use a high-speed camera. But it's just stuff like that that kind of shows, you know, it, it, and we can explain that, it, that our free fall circuitry now works, and then you can kind of jump to the other stuff of finishing the design. So it's sort of these milestones of like, hey, the, fr the free fall stuff works, check off that from our list, and now we can move on. Oh, there's a piece of popcorn. <laughs> um, so let's see, those are the demonstrations. What other ones do I have? Um, the next one was, this one was really interesting. Um, so we're using this, this mind control headset, this emotive headset for, this, for the anger management demolition build. And this thing is a brand new headset. It, it hadn't even been announced yet. Um, and, and the company, they, they had four of them in existence, and the company gave us two of them to use uh, for the show. And it was just this totally complicated thing about, you know, it's measuring your brain waves, and it's and usually controlling stuff on a computer screen. It's, it's designed for video games, um, but we wanted to use it to control physical objects, and like, it's just such this obscure thing that's hard to explain to people. Um, so we came up with this cool demo um, that I'll show you here. And this was actually, I ripped this from the website, so the quality is really bad. Um, but uh, you know, this was this was probably the best way to explain how we can use the headset. Until now, the emotive headset has only been used to move objects on a computer screen. But Zaz has created a test to see if the thought reading headset can be used to move a real object, a variation on the classic psychic spoon bending trick. Here's how this test is going to work. I'm going to be concentrating with the emotive controller to push that cube on the screen. When I push that cube, it's going to send an event to my code, which is going to send an electrical signal along these wires, which is going to talk to this servo controller, which will turn on this E-switch, which will send power to this actuator, which will bend this spoon. The good old spoon bending test. Enable power. All right, you're good to go. All right, spoon, prepare to get bent. The headset is picking up electrical signals from Zaza's brain that are fed into the computer. And when he calms himself enough and concentrates, the computer triggers a motor that pulls down a wire, yeah. bending the spoon. That spoon looks bent. Yuri Gela, eat your heart out. Your powers are strong. <laughs> spoon conquered. He actually was really thinking about it and stuff. And most people are like, yeah, right, whatever. But I thought the same thing until I tried it. It was totally cool. Um, but of course, you got you to gotta bend the spoon when you're dealing with mind tricks. And uh, that one went over, went over really well. Because otherwise, it's just like, you know, there's so, so many obscure topics. And you can choose, choose your own obscure topic to apply to this. Um, so another one was, uh, let's see, the, um, what do they call it? The Gecko Superhuman Suit. And uh, this one hasn't aired yet. I think it airs. So one, one episode airs tomorrow. There's three more to go. One, ep one episode airs tomorrow, and then a week from then, and then a week after that. So um, this one is the Gecko Superhuman Suit, which I think is the, not this week, but next week. Um, so I'm going to show you stuff that will never see the light of day. Um, this was something where we had to, basically the gecko, this gecko suit was an attempt to enable a human to climb up a vertical surface. 
and we had two different versions. One was climbing up smooth glass, and one was climbing up uh, rough surfaces. So I'm not going to give anything away because the episode hasn't aired. Um, but what we wanted to show is like, well, maybe you could just use suction cups, right, and like climb up a smooth surface. Um, but suction cups don't really work um, because you can hang, but then you can't pull it back to move up to the next one. So we just came up with this really stupid idea of like, you know, putting suction cups on somebody and seeing if, if that would work. Um, which it didn't, but this was actually more fun. And this is also like a really good stress reliever. This thing here. Okay, we got a camera out here too. <laughs> <laughs> That was I don't and remember. And they're filming this, you know, we didn't know if they were going to use it or not. Uh, hey, anybody? <laughs> you can hear me hey, now. I've got a great idea for a film. <laughs> <laughs> this is like anger management at its best. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. I'm pretty sure. Oh, careful now, guys. So. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, right. That, yeah, actually, that was Terry. So there wasn't a lot of machining for him to do on this part of the project. So we figured he actually volunteered for that one. Um, but you know, this was a demonstration where we didn't know if it was if they were going to use it or not. Actually, we didn't know if they were going to use anything we ever produced. Um, so in this case, they didn't use that. Um, but I I use it all the time because I think it's funny. Um, so you know, sometimes you're trying things that that have never been done before and. Um, they don't go over so well. So that's, you know, you, when you're taking a risk, sometimes you lose and you end up with things that you can't use. But, um, I, you know, I think it's better to take the risk and do some things that maybe are a little bit non-standard and just see what happens. So apply that to writing advisories or, or producing, you know, product videos or whatever. Um, this, this last demonstration was from the 6x6 robot, where basically there was the six legs, and those were all created by these, cust um, we had custom um, carbon fiber legs that had to be strong in certain directions but not others and they were completely designed um, by Mike North who is our mechanical engineer material scientist guy um, and he was trying to basically demonstrate that with a dynamic load you know as they're moving up and down so if this 500 pound robots walking with the dynamic load the legs aren't gonna break because you look at them and you're like oh those things totally look like they're gonna break um, and it's carbon fiber right it's usually really fragile so he was like well I'm gonna come up with a demonstration that you know can show that show how complicated these legs are but also show how strong they are um, so he came up with this thing called the forklift rodeo and uh, oops let me adjust the size of this So this also didn't make it into the episode. Um, but basically, you can see here's the leg, which is in here. And he added this piece of wood on the forklift that would basically, when you move the forklift up and down, it would flex. His weight would, would sit down on the leg and sort of flex the leg to show this th dynamic strength. Um, so we'll show you what happened. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm upstairs laughing my ass off. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, some tests don't go so well. Um, <laughs> but, it, I mean, in, in concept, that worked, right? I mean, it showed the flexing of the leg. So, demonstrations, kind of, you know, fun stuff to, to prove a point. <laughs> Actually, that was the, so I put up a bunch of videos on YouTube, um, but not that one, because I figured, like, I'll let Mike put that one up, because <laughs> that was just so, it, it, yeah. He was hurting for a long time with that one. Um, but, you know, those, showing milestones, so maybe, maybe if you're, you know, working on some midterm report or, you know, mid, mid quarter report or something, you want to show something fun, you, you know, write, either write something or make a video or I don't know. Um, Let's see. And then so the payoff, we had the final thing. The goal of every episode was to show the final product, show the payoff. What exactly did we do? You know, why did we do it? What we, did, did we do what we set out to do? Um, so we'd have to prove that. Um, most of the time the episodes worked, sometimes they didn't. And, uh, but of course, that's how it goes with engineering and that's how it goes with everything else, right? It's like you try something and it might not work, uh, but you still need to document the process. And a lot of times the fun, and especially with this show, is, is going through the process. So if you're writing something or you're, you're explaining something to somebody, you still want to show them the process because that's where you learn a lot um, from that process. Um, this quote I saw that was etched into the side of the um, uh, computer museum in San Jose. 
from Gordon Moore, if everything you try works and you're not trying hard enough. And that's something that, oh yeah, I should mention too, geez. At the beginning of the show, all the producers would only want us to build stuff that we knew would work. <laughs> so, you know, besides all of those other constraints, it's like, well, is it gonna work? Ah, uh, I don't know. Okay, so don't do that. Um, so w when our first failure happened, um, I won't tell you which one in case you guys haven't seen it, but when our first failure happened, um, Discovery was like, oh my God, how are we gonna cover for this in the episode? What are we gonna do? And uh, you know, all of the hosts were like, well, just show them that it didn't work and like, explain that it didn't work. But still, you know, we did really cool stuff along the way and we're still gonna show that process. They're like, oh no, 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 that's not gonna work. And the, the editors were like, oh my God, we're so screwed. Um, <laughs> but I sent them this quote and I'd, I'd seen that just recently, so it was sort of timely and I sent them that quote and then they start editing stuff together. They're like, yeah, it actually does work. It's okay if, you know, it's okay if the project fails. We're still showing them things that they need to, that the viewer needs to learn. So that was sort of cool. It's like that, you know, kind of changed their mindset a little bit. Um, and, you know, just driving home the final point about what needs to get done. Um, so let's see. Yeah, this is, this is my, my conclusion slide. Um, again, you know, I'm talking just about TV here and I show some really silly examples that are video based, but you can, you know, maybe get some ideas about how to just make your writing more fun or, the, you know, your website more fun or your blog more fun or maybe videos if you're doing videos. I think videos help a lot to be able to convey information, even if it's supposed to be, you know, you're trying to explain a buffer overflow. You can do it in a lot of really cool ways with video um, to explain a concept that most people wouldn't normally care about. So it might be fun to, to try some of that. And you can see, like, the, this stuff was all professionally edited, but you don't need to be a professional editor to, you know, cut stuff together. Um, so basically, you know, understand your audience and present accordingly. So, you know, if you're writing something for your CEO, don't write it like you're writing it to, you know, your lab partner. Um, you know, one type of writing doesn't always work. One type of video doesn't always work. You have to understand your audience. Um, break down the information into bite-sized points, these little chunks. Um, you know, sort of like the, the, uh, the sea cave podcast. It's like, we have the magnetic sensor. We're gonna use this to control the joystick. The joystick, you know, regular joystick is used to control video games. It doesn't work so well underwater. You know, just these little points and people are like, oh yeah, you're right. Um, and then using graphics, video, audio. And uh, again, yeah, don't be afraid to try new methods of, of, of ex explaining your work. Um, chances are it won't get you fired if you do something a little controversial to, you know, a little more fun. Um, if it does, just don't come chasing after me. Uh, but you know, when we were filming this stuff, we had no idea if the network was gonna like it. We had no idea if the audience was gonna like it. Um, but we just did what we thought would be a good way to show our work. Um, and most of the time it worked. So I thought it was sort of cool. Um, that's it for me. Um, if you guys have questions, you can email me or you know, we have a few minutes if you wanna ask questions here, or if you wanna see more videos or whatever, um, I'm happy to show you. Oh, and also I'm gonna mention this a little plug. Um, I, I run a charity called Kingpin Empire, which is, there's a desk outside right near the, the t-shirt booth. Um, that's basically uh, um, collecting money to donate to various um, hacker-related, technology-related, health-related charities um, just to help out the community. So all the money um, from t-shirts and stuff go to the charities. And there's a flyer out there, you can read about it. So go check it out. Um, but that's it, so any questions? No questions? There's a question, ah, two questions. Yes. <laughs> there's a fair amount of crashing that goes on beforehand before you actually get to the point where you have to even present. So did they really film you going through the whole process? Or did you film a bunch of stuff first and then, they, then you kind of recreated it? Right? right. So the question was, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of real work that goes on that sometimes isn't always shown. Um, you know, thrashing around. Rob and I did a hardware hacking project once, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into it before you write the final report. Um, so, you know, did, did they actually film all of that? Um, sometimes, yes. But they'd basically only film stuff if I go to them and say, okay, I'm about to rip this thing apart. You want to film this because something might happen. Um, but most of the time they're like, rip it apart, you know, get it to the point where you can explain something. So for like the circuit design, when I was designing the, or you know, maybe even building the prototype for the, for the demonstration for the podcast, they didn't film that because they just wanted to see the final sort of you know, product of, of moving, the, moving the magnet over the sensor. So they didn't always film everything, um, much to my chagrin. I thought they should have because... I think it's exciting, but they, they, did, they did film a lot more of the cutting and grinding and welding than this stuff. So, um, you know, we had to kind of fight to get our stuff shown. There's another question. Yeah, I was trying to understand the kind of like the dynamics there. I think that the rest of the company does some stuff also. Is that true? Is that right? Yeah, that's, a, that's 
Yeah. Prototype this has far too much going on. And you know, I'm profile. Uh, as folks know, I'm going to be retiring soon and maybe building a farm. And I'm going to be podcasting this every month. Cool. Now, for that build, I've been collecting parts for it's two months now. I have <coughs> every piece of fiberglass, every piece of wood, the metal, I have the mill, I have the lathe. Well, you're the lucky one. <laughs> right. Well, that that's the thing, right? I, I mean, basically, they are not understanding their audience, right? It's like one of the things I say, they don't understand what makes Mythbusters a success. And that's why they just assumed, oh, we'll get four guys, we'll throw them together, we'll build crazy stuff, and it will work. Which, I, which is also too many. Right. Yeah, yeah, you have a love triangle. Or a love quadrangle or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it, there, it was definitely complicated, and that was something, and it was also not a sustainable show. Because Mythbusters, you go, okay, what's a cool urban legend? And, you know, there's billions of them. But builds, I mean, you'll be able to come up with builds, too, but it was just a very challenging show. Um, but, yeah, they, without totally bashing the production company, because this film, the tapes are still on, you're right. They didn't understand the audience, they didn't understand the dynamic, um, and they didn't understand engineering enough, I think. Because... It's exactly the same company, you know, and it was just not there. Yes. Um, <laughs> I was very relieved when I found out that we, that we weren't doing the show anymore. It's a, I mean, it, you know, it's a challenge, and, and you know, people, people have to deal with it all the time. Luckily, I don't because I work on my own, but, you know, there's people that have to deal with this, you know, type of, you know, whatever, idiocracy, whatever you want to call it, every day. And they want to claw their brains out. But to a point, you know, we knew that we had something special and we could kind of share our passion with the world. And it was like, well, you know, I just wanted to get an entire episode done so I could have the DVD set. And I was like, okay, I'm going to suck it up and do it um, and fight with these guys. And, you know, maybe, maybe I can impart some knowledge on them and maybe they'll get it and maybe we'll be able to share stuff with people. And the, the TV show actually, you know, spawned the, the, some of the audience. I got emails from, they're like, oh my God, you made engineering fun. I'm going to go be an engineer. And it's like, that's, you know, that's cool. So you deal with a bunch of idiots for a while, but then you get people that are actually, you know, their life is changed by it. So there was definitely good that came out of it, you know, but it was, it was a learning experience of, of uh, and it made me think about the work I do and how I can just share it with people so they actually care. Any other questions? No? Good. All right. That's a wrap. Thank you. <laughs>